It may sound trite or even cliche-ish, but the pants one leg at a time is true. They're, they're people. They think about things. They're interested in things that, you know, they're the president, you're in the White House, and it is austere. But on the break, they'll still talk baseball, and they'll wonder about things. And I've had great moments, moments, with press, standing with Clinton in a room where you could see out to Pennsylvania Avenue. And he's saying, boy, I envy them out there. What do you envy? That they can be out there. It's lonely in here. Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. Lonely in here. Asking Nixon, what, what, do you, what do you think about the Watergate? And I've never been in it. Don't look at it when I drive by. Th those are the kind of questions I like. See, I like to ask human questions. I think things like that. What does Nixon think when he drives by? But he gave me one of the best stories ever. Oh, uh, we started doing on my local show in Miami, asking people where they were when Kennedy died. And then eventually that became a show on the fifth anniversary of his death in 1968. So we played a bunch of people telling where they were, Bob Hope, Tony Randall, George Smathers, Senator Smathers, but Nixon's. There was no story like Nixon. And no one had asked him. No one had asked him where he was. And where he was was Dallas. His law firm represented Pepsi-Cola. He flew to Dallas for the, the Pepsi-Cola convention and as their representative lawyer to attend their convention. He left from Love Field, November 22, 1963. He's looking out the window, and they're preparing the field. They're laying out a bunch of flowers and roses and for the arrival of President Kennedy. The man sitting next to him, but then, you know, presidents, when they left office then, didn't have Secret Service. That only happened after Kennedy was killed. The man sitting next to him on the plane said, you know, for a couple thousand votes here or there, it could have been you landing here today. And Nixon said to him, I never think about it. And they take off. They land in New York three hours later. He, and the, the car that was supposed to pick him up didn't miss flight. They had the wrong plane, more, the wrong airline. So he took a cab back to his law, legal office. He's in the cab, and they're driving down the street, and the cab misses the entrance to the Grand Central Parkway. So he turns around, he's on a private street and going back to the entrance. And a woman comes running out of a house, this is Nixon telling a story, screaming, just screaming, yelling. So he pull, opens up the window to the cab and he looks out the window and he says, can I help you? And she faints. So he jumps out of the cab, they revive her, she looks up and she says, they, I just saw on television that Kennedy was shot. And I, I didn't know what to do, and I ran out in the street. And the first person I see is Nixon. And the whole world was coming to an end. In fact, in one day, we did back-to-back -back Ahmadinejad, Chavez, and Gaddafi. Back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. That was a hectic day. First, the day before, I had breakfast at the Iranian ambassador's house, or the charge the affair, I guess, is not an ambassador. And they were very pleased having set this up, and they made it special for me because we're seen in Iran extensively. And, uh, and then I had a tough time with him. First, all the Iranian security around, and uh, we got into a discussion about the Holocaust. and. I sort of left the podium I usually have and got into sort of a tangle with him. And it was rough having all these people staring at you, not in a pleasant fashion. Gaddafi was strange is that he kept us waiting for an hour and a half and then they came in and introduced him. A man comes in and actually says, and now the brother leader. And he walks in, I thought it was in a foreign film. And uh, I liked Chavez very much, Venezuela, I got along with him. He was very Western and fun and 
interesting. And but that, that, to have that happen to a little Jewish kid from Brooklyn in one day to go back to back, it's you get an interesting life. But basically, when the interview starts, it's still the same. Tough. Margaret Thatcher was well within herself. Uh, easy to interview because you knew she'd give you a forthright opinion, very strong in her own positiveness, if that's a word. She uh, believed in what she believed in, and you were going to know what she believed in, and by God, she was right. I got along with her very well, though. Tony Blair was American. I mean, he was British, but American in style. Uh, Tony Blair was sort of Chicago. You know, I like, he's very down to earth, easy, easy to handle, forthcoming, not as positive as Thatcher, but very much a leader. I got friendly with Gorbachev the uh, first time I interviewed him, the day before we had arranged to have dinner at Duke Zebra's very popular place in Washington. And you came up to Duke's up in Escalade, it was on the second floor of a building. And I was waiting with some friends, and Gorbachev came up, and the first thing he did was take his jacket off and show me he was wearing suspenders. That kind of flipped me. Uh, and I always got along with him. He, uh, Gorbachev has the world's best interpreter. When you interview people that don't speak your language, those are the hardest interviews, because you're depending on the interpreter. And the interpreter has to catch nuance as well. And when you do simultaneous interpretation, which is the kind you want to do, you don't want to wait until the question is asked. You want it to happen as a, he has the best. This man, little man with him with a mustache, I forget his name, been with him for years. And I, I have a great deal of affection for Gorbachev. I had a wonderful story happen with Gorbachev. It was uh, George Bush's 80th birthday. And we had a big party for him at Minimaid Park in Houston, the baseball stadium. And George Bush the first asked me to emcee it. And all his sons came, including the president, and he had world leaders there. He had the former president of France, the former president of Mexico, former prime minister of Canada, former prime minister of Great Britain, and Gorby. And each were scheduled to speak, and I'm the emcee. And the program was really running late. They had country singers and everything, so. I got the five leaders together, and I said, uh, fellas, uh, how about one of you, one of you speak for all the rest? So the uh, former Mulroney, the former Prime Minister of Canada, said, okay, I will speak for all of us. And Gorbachev said, yet. You know, I flew here, to this interpreter, so I flew here from Moscow for this, and I will, if I'm not speaking, I will not stand up with the rest. And he goes and sits down. So now I got a dilemma, and I'm handling this, and they're all looking at each other. The other four world leaders are looking at each other. And Dan Quayle was sitting there by, and he looks at me, and he says, I told you, I told you. <laughs> so I go over to George Bush, the first, 41, and um, I said to him, Mr. President, I got, I got a problem here. We, we, we're running real late. And so I offered one of them to speak, and Mulroney offered to speak. And Gorbachev's very mad. And he looked at me with that innocent look on his face, the president, he said, he changed the world. He changed the world. He's got to speak. So Gorbachev spoke for all of them. And I had to go back and get him to come back. And Mulroney acquiesced and stood behind. And that was an interesting predicament to be put into. Again, I'm, this, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. What am I doing here with these five guys at a birthday party with the current president, the former president, five other presidents, prime ministers, and an angry Russian? The best, Nelson Mandela. Uh, I would have to call him the greatest leader of the 20th century. And maybe the greatest individual I've ever met in my lifetime. To endure what he endured, to do what he did after he got out, was, was amazing. I loved interviewing him, and I had an extraordinary day. I went to South Africa some years back on a speaking tour for a group of banks. 
they they paid me to go in to speak in Johannesburg, Cape Town, two other cities, and uh, to visit, go to Mandela's house. And I, in the same day, I went to Mandela's house for lunch and had dinner with de Klerk, who freed Mandela. So I was with both of them the same day. That was a day I'll never forget in my life going to Mandela's house. Also walking in South Africa, you know, you, n you never think, I never think I'm on all over the world. When I'm on the air, I never think of that. Ted Turner never thought of it when he started CNN that we'd have that kind of impact. But when I was walking in South Africa, you go up a little hill and around a turn toward Mandela's house, and there was a guy who came out like of a hut, and Lady King live! <laughs> it still <laughs> drives you a little, we it's weird. It's just weird. Arafat was a, 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 a tough cookie. I did him twice. Um, he had that. He had a funny sense of. Um, he had a funny little laugh. He liked to laugh. Didn't it didn't appear that way publicly, but he liked to laugh. Uh, Colin Powell was there at the time. He watched me interview, and he was sitting off to the side. He watched me interview Arafat. Arafat was uh, was was tough in that his interpreter wasn't the greatest. So I had, a, and I understand he could speak English, but he chose not to. Yeah, I wished he would have spoken English. Second time I did him twice, he did speak English, but the first time he did not, and uh, it was perfunctory. You know, nothing much to elaborate on. Interesting little man. The favorite is Clinton because of his steel trap mind. He is never dull, and he knows everything about everything. I've never met anyone like that. He knows streets in Guadalupe. He knows the president of Greenland and the backup center on the Arkansas basketball team. When you can get with a guy like that, that's fun. He's the, he's the best interview. I like him as a guy, too.